That's right, you heard me, 120. You're a yellow-bellied liar and a cheat. What you just say to me? You heard me, you coward. What did you just say to me? Did you hear what he just said to me? It's one of the most unfriendly things I ever heard. You're lucky I don't just bash you to death right now. You're lucky that they put my six-shooter at the door to this stupid saloon. Yeah, he don't like losing very much. That's right. He just don't like losing and he knows it. Look, you made me throw my carrots. Stop smoking cigars. All right, musician. You can keep playing your music for now. I think that fireworks is over. So, I guess I don't need a shovel. I don't know why to have a shovel in the saloon in the first place. But uh, today, after I'm done with my carrot, we're gonna be talking about psychology. That's right, some interesting stuff coming on with neurotransmitters and localization of function in the brain. So for now, I'm gonna have to tell you, that's enough goofing around. I think I'll go up and dig a grave for Mr. Rudy back behind me. That's right, you heard me. You're lucky to have to teach psychology for these good folks just coming here and trying to learn. All right. Well, I guess we're just going to have to stop here with the music and get right into the lesson. So, hello, welcome. This is Psychology Again, and we're going to continue on our discussion with biopsychology, and we're going to look at a few different things here. Today, um, we're going to look at two things, which uh, the cowboy guy, I just told you. Um, but anyway, so uh, we're going to look at neurotransmitters and behavior just a little bit. You're going to learn a lot more about neurotransmitters later on. Remember what were neurotransmitters? Let me go back a little bit to show you once again. Go back a few things. I changed the colors around up here. I'll put that one up there again. Um, neurotransmitters are, whoops, and then freeze it, unfreeze it, I mean. Uh, so, neurotransmitters are the little things that, oh, look at that, somebody brought a piano. I can sing you a piano song. That's the worst song ever. Uh, neurotransmitters are the things that are getting released into the synapse and going over to the other side of the, uh, to the next neuron, to the receptor sites of the next neuron, and they continue to signal a lot. I'm not gonna get any more to it than that. Um, but, um, so you can see it there, there's the things that are coming out of the vesicles and into the next neuron. Um, anyway, so we talked about this last time, so let me get into, I guess I could do this like this, let me get into different specific neurotransmitters and behavior. Neurotransmitters and behavior, okay. Like I said, this is not everything you're going to need to know about these neurotransmitters, but at some point in time, I need to introduce them. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a lot of, I mean, these neurotransmitters will become so common knowledge and a common part of your vocabulary as time goes on that um, you won't even really you know, wonder about them uh, anymore. Uh, but like I said, I have to introduce them sometime and today is the day that I'm gonna introduce them and we're gonna talk about how they work and we're gonna look at different studies in which they are implicated and significant and um, yes, so. Anyway, the first one, it says acetylcholine. That's how you say it, acetylcholine. At least I think that's how you say it. Um, it's excitatory at the synapses. Those are the little spaces in between. Involved in muscular movement. Also very important for learning and memory. Okay? Very important for learning and memory. If you have a lack of acetylcholine, or a lack of, yes, if you have a lack of acetylcholine, you'll have a very poor memory and you will have a hard time learning. Now, 
For somebody who is in constant stress, for instance, suffering from anxiety, or just basically stressed out all the time, what happens is the acetylcholine receptor sites in the hippocampus, okay, I'm gonna talk about the hippocampus later, I'll talk about it now in just a second, but a more specific, it's a very important part of the brain. Anyway, the, acet the acetylcholine sites, receptor sites, where the acetylcholine gets picked up in the hippocampus get damaged, diminished. There are fewer of them. That means those parts of the brain that are responsible for learning new things cannot do it because the, the hardware is not there. Now we're going to talk about this a lot. And so anyway, so too much acetylcholine is related to depression. Undersupply produces memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. Absence produces paralysis. Okay? Um, so, so the hippocampus, just so you know, we're going to talk about it today, later. The hippocampus is a part of the brain which I'm going to show you where it's at. You're going to get a, a video. It's a really good video called up that a guy named Bozeman does. Um, but anyway, so I'm going to have you, I'm going to link it into the, um, the description of this video. Um, but anyway, so um, it's, it's a part of the brain which is responsible for short-term memory to long-term memory encoding. You don't know what these things are yet, but we have a short-term memory which lasts about 30 seconds. We have a long-term memory which we would think of as our memories, like the hard disk, our brain, if you want to use a computer metaphor. Um, but anyway, so the hippocampus is, is part of the brain which transfers short-term memories to long-term memories. Now, if acetylcholine receptor sites are not picking up um, things, they're not picking, just there aren't enough of them, you will not be able to encode long-term memories. And that's the most important thing for learning is encoding memories because, yeah, that's what learning is. Okay, so acetylcholine is very important. Um, people who are suffering from PTSD have problems with this system. Uh, you know, all kinds of things. There, there's a lot of them. And we're going to look at a very famous study, well-known study that they did on rats later on. But not today. Okay, dopamine. Super important. Dopamine is the... It's, You'll hear about dopamine sometimes, like I'm just, people will talk about dopamine, like you need your dopamine hit. I, I even hear it on this radio station I'll listen to sometimes, like this makes your dopamine. No, it's, that's stupid. Um, anyway, and so, and you know what happens when they say stupid stuff? Yeah. Makes me want to go get my shovel and do some harm with it. Yep. Dopamine, it's excitatory, involved with voluntary movement, emotional arousal, learning, memory, and experiencing pain or pleasure. An undersupply of dopamine can lead to depression and Parkinson's disease. An oversupply is related to schizophrenia. It doesn't mean it causes schizophrenia. It could be the schizophrenia causes an oversupply of dopamine. Nobody really knows, 400% sure in that one. Um, but, so, so the idea with this is they call dopamine your pleasure, your pleasure neurotransmitter. Like for instance, when you eat a bunch of chocolate, nom, 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 it does release some dopamine in your system, you get pleasure out of it. Uh, for instance, when people smoke marijuana, or they take something like, you know, a, a, really a lot of drugs, but a lot of drugs that releases dopamine and it stimulates the pleasure centers of your brain, it's related to the pleasure centers of your brain. Um, somebody, some people know what a runner's high is. For instance, you run and you get this feeling. That's a release of dopamine into the pleasure centers of the brain. Um, sexual activity releases dopamine. There's a whole bunch of things. We, we strive after, I guess you could say, that the dopamine stimulating our pleasure center. That's kind of what it's about. And so you can see if you have an undersupply, it's kind of hard to feel joy or happiness about anything. So you can lead into depression. Dopamine, we will talk about a lot. Dopamine is indicated in so many mental illnesses. It's a, of all of these, all of these are, are really important. But, um, so depression and anxiety and all kinds of mental illnesses, dopamine is related. And, and people try to get the dopamine levels in check through medication. Okay, so uh, just continue. Norepinephrine, um, it's associated with excitatory and inhibitory functions at various sites, involved in neural circuits related to controlling memory, learning, wakefulness, and eating. Too little is associated with depression, and too much is associated with schizophrenia. Now, if you look at an MRI, or if you look at brain activity scan, we're going to talk about scans today too. If we look at a brain activity scan or an MRI of a, uh, of a schizophrenic patient, um, 
what you'll see is that the frontal lobes particularly are just booming with activity. And what it is, it's a massive influx of dopamine and serotonin, or I don't know, norepinephrine and dopamine. And it causes so much activity to go on in the brain. Um, interestingly, um, it's fairly, not completely similar, but there are some pretty big parallels between the brain of somebody who's on LSD and the brain of somebody who is on schizophrenia. Um, and so they've known this for a while and they actually tried to treat schizophrenics with LSD and it was just a complete failure because, I mean, that's the last thing a schizophrenic needs, uh, really. Um, so to not, be, anyway. So, so that's just, you know, one of those interesting things, okay? Um, so serotonin, super important. If anybody, have, if any of you watching have ever been to, or even if you haven't been, this is what happens, um, been to the doctor for depression, and, you know, a lot of people are, are feeling depressed now with this COVID thing going on, feeling unsure about the future, um, you know, not have, being able to have the general routines that you have always had, and so on and so forth. A lot of people are feeling anxious and kind of depressed, and, and it's, it's as a result, I'm sure people will start going to psychologists a lot more. But what's going to happen is if with this feeling of depression, um, one of the first things they do if you go to a medical model, I don't mean a the therapy, but if you go to the medical model, your regular do doctor or practitioner, what they'll generally do, they might send you to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, um, but they will prescribe, uh, it's called an SSRI. This is kind of really the first line, I guess you could say, the simplest and most the initial line of medication for depression. It's called a select serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So all of a sudden you see serotonin is indicated. Let's read it here and then I'll talk a little bit more about that. Significant for moods, sleep, eating, and arousal may be related to relaying pleasure and pain. Too little serotonin is related to both depression, panic illness, like anxiety disorder or phobics, phobias, as well as OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Some antidepressants raise serotonin levels of receptor sites. So a select serotonin reuptake inhibitor, what that does is, okay, your body's producing serotonin, but for some people they absorb too much serotonin. So you have, a, you have too little for your system to function properly. So select serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Remember I talked last time about the little Pac-9 guy who eats up the excess neurotransmitters and the synapses in your system? Well, basically what that, what the, the mouth, that was a monoamine oxidized, I think that's it. Like I said last time, I can never remember exactly what it is, but I think I got it right this time. Um, but so, um, so what happens is, you think of Pac-Man, and just think if you take something, you stuff a big sort of like, I don't know, a, a dodgeball in Pac-Man's mouth. And so he can't take up those things. That's, that's basically what it does. It stops your body from reabsorbing, um, your stop from reabsorbing serotonin. So subsequently you have a net increase of serotonin. Okay, I'm just gonna check how much time I'm spending on this. Uh, okay. Uh, GABA. GABA is an inhibitory transmitter in the motor system. Um, and basically what it does is GABA is sent out to tell your system to stop doing something. Uh, we'll talk about GABA more, it's important. Um, here, I'll give you an example. Like for instance, why do people who smoke marijuana get the munchies? The munchies. You know, the munch marijuana I think is probably the only reason Cheetos even exists in this world. Um, but, so, so what happens is, when you eat normally, okay, you have a signal that goes out and tells you you're full, right? It's a neurotransmitter, it's a signal, it says, beep, beep, you've eaten enough. It sends signals back and forth and you feel full, okay? It gets you to quit eating. Um, with marijuana, and, and it GABA, so with marijuana, um, it releases GABA, and GABA stops the signal that tells you that you're full. So that's why people who smoke marijuana get the munchies, because the sig they're probably full, but the signal that tells them they're full has stopped, and so subsequently they feel hungry. Okay, so, so that it's GABA's just kind of, GABA does a bunch of different things, and we'll talk more about it as we go on. I just want to introduce these most significant ones. There are more neurotransmitters. These are probably the most significant for IV psychology, at least. Uh, okay. And so, so, all right, so let me go through, let me go through um, uh, some ways that we scan the brain. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about 
you know, about localization of functions. So a bunch of different things in here. Um, and we're going to talk more specifically about a brain techniques. So we're going to talk about them a lot. But this is an introduction to these things. And when we get into talking about studies specifically, we'll talk more about brain specific things. Um, there's, you've got a couple different types of ways. I hope this color is better, by the way. Um, I switched it up a little bit because it was kind of not really easy to see up here, even though you have the PowerPoint still. So you have invasive and non-invasive, two important categories. Invasive studying of the brain means you actually dig into the brain, okay? You dig in there, you get into the brain. And I'll show you a picture on the next page of the example, on the next slide, of an example of invasive brain surgery, okay? And they do actually do this. There's some videos out of people actually doing brain surgery. Well, I'll talk about it in a second. Non-invasive means you, invasive means you go into the brain, or go into the head, go into the brain. Non-invasive means you do not go into the body at all. You just do scans and stuff like this. Okay? Uh, I just said that. Um, so there's different types of non-invasive scanning. Now, obviously, the non-invasive is going to be more preferable because you don't want to open somebody's skull and put them in surgery and all that kind of stuff. You only have to do it, like, for instance, if you're taking out a tumor or you have other things going on in there that need some work. Um, all right? So non-invasive is like EEG, that's what you see here, which will be there. Oh, that's the old thing, it's like, the, you know, they put a bunch of sort of like electrodes on your head and or, and you would just get a readout. Uh, brain imaging such as MRI, magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, FMRI, when they're looking at specific functions. Uh, CAT scan, CAT. Uh, and then also a PET scan, positron emission tomography. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these a little bit, each of them, as we go through, so you know what they are. They both have, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so here's an example, and that guy, I'm going to go over there. Um, okay, so you see what they're doing is they're doing brain surgery on this guy. And he's awake. They're playing the guitar. And he's driving a little spiraly thing. Draw me a spiral. I don't want to draw you a spiral. I ain't drawing no spiral. Draw a spiral. Or we'll dig up part of your brain. All right, I'll draw a spiral. Um, and so, so he's actually awake doing that. Why did they do that? Well, they do that because if somebody has like a brain tumor or let's say a, a, a blockage, or like a, a, like a um, clot in their brain and they need to get it out of there so they don't die, uh, what they do is they keep the person awake. You don't have any sensory neurons in your brain. You can't feel it at all. I mean, you just can't feel it. Um, <coughs> and so uh, what they'll do is they'll keep the people awake because they don't want to mess anything up. Remember, the brain is so packed. They have to be really, really careful in there. Um, and, you know, the areas are so compact in there. They don't want to hit a wrong area. So they'll go through with, like, an electrode or something, and they'll touch different areas. And you can actually touch, for instance, the olfactory, the sort of sense, the place where you have smell, and you actually can smell something. Nobody apparently can define really what the smell is. They just smell something. Or bink on your hearing, hearing parts of your brain, same thing. Bink on the visual parts of your brain, and you can have you know vision stuff like lights and, and weird stuff. And so they're doing this so that the guy is conscious, and they're not like Whoa. so. If he can play the guitar and he's going along, but all of a sudden if he goes, Whoa, you know, like that because they did something up there. Well, they know, hey, we're in the wrong spot. We're drawing something. They want you to do something a little bit complex, a talk, they want you to talk. Because if you're talking along and then you're like, or, 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 or you're talking along and you say, I can't remember the words. All these are different parts of the brain, so do this stuff. Um, then they know they're in the wrong spot. But that's only in, in extreme. They don't do this for just like because or anything like that. Um, so they're doing this for specific reasons. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is a magnetic resonance imaging. Um, if more specifically for psychology, we're usually dealing with an fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. They're looking at specific functions of different parts of the brain. Um, in our MRI is, you know, if anybody's had knee injury or, or, or a concussion or something like that, very likely they'll put you in an MRI because they, it takes a look at the blood flow inside. You can't have any metal on you or anything like that, or like plunk, because it's a big magnet. So you don't want to, you can't have like a pacemaker, I mean it would kill you, you just like, who knows what it would do, but it would be really bad. 
Um, so, so, but it gives a sort of like brain scan of the active brain. So they'll put you in there, they'll have you look at pictures, um, they'll, you know, may ask you things, maybe listen to music. You're supposed to lay like, completely, totally still. Um, and it goes, kunk, kunk. So that's taking pictures of the brain. And if you uh, mess up, um, if you mess up, if you move too much, they'll start it, have to start it over. And that's one of the problems with it. But that's, that's basically what it is. Okay. Um, PET scan. Positron emission top tomography. That's what it is. Positron em emission tomography. Okay. And <laughs> this, they inject a radioactive marker into your system. It doesn't hurt you, they say. Um, but they inject it into your system. Or you, I think you can drink it, as a matter of fact, as well. But anyway, so it gets into your system. And so subsequently, what they can do is they have a tool, they have a machine that can trace it in the brain. So what it does is as the blood flows around and this radioactive marker is in there, they can see where the blood flow is going on. They can see the blood flow in different parts of the brain there. So the red is more active, blue is less active, yellow is in the middle somewhere. And so, um, so then they can do different things. They can have you do something and see where it's active over here. Have you do something else and see where it's active over there. And so that's the idea. Polish the Tron emission tomography. Okay. Um, all right. I think actually, let me see. Yeah. That's going to be good for that video. Now. That's right. I'm going to get back there to my game. And I'll tell you. If he starts doing anything again, one thing's going to happen. Stop smoking. 